pretty sure that the people that made those comments were actually trolls that were paid to try to negate what I had said. It doesn't matter. People can say whatever they want to say. This is the issue. And I'm going to show this to you to show you how unreliable the testing is, which I talked about on the first video. It, 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 gets, it gets really crazy. So I want to show you a couple of things. The first is this article was a fantastic article, but it was taken down from multiple different websites where it had been posted for whatever reason. I'm not sure the reason why it was, why it was taken down, but it was more likely than not censorship related. Now, this person's name is Aaron Ginn or Aaron Jin. Fantastic article, Evidence Over Hysteria COVID-19. And I have the whole article in its original form, and we will be posting this up. Anybody that wants this information, we are going to post this up on advancedmedicine.com. We will not have it available just right on the front. It will be on the back so nobody can try to complain about it or nobody can try to censor it. So we are going to have it. If you register, you will be able to get access to it. It's not going to cost you anything, but it will also give you the ability to take the head map, which is the advanced health evaluation assessment for detoxification if you want. But this article is a very important article, and I think that everybody should read it. And the reason simply is because there is a lot of logical, very scientifically organized information that will help to make those that are not aware of really what the facts are and to see what the facts really are in order to make a logical sequential decision as to whether or not this constitutes evidence of hysteria or not and it actually is very clear even without reading the study that that's what it is when you once you understand the information the other thing that i wanted to explain before we get into the evidence of the scientific corruption is that the Centers for Disease Control, when they are trying to determine the cause of death, when there's more than a few people that have died, when there's some type of a issue where the Centers for Disease Control is warranted for, to investigate to find the cause of death, they send out two teams. Now, we always hear, like in the movies, the outbreak and the Ebola and all this stuff and all these movies, everybody glorifies the primary team that everybody knows about from the CDC, which is the infectious disease team, okay? They send out the infectious disease team to find the source of infection. But there's a second team they also send out, but nobody glorifies that team, and that's the toxicological team. So nobody talks about the toxicological team, and in this particular case, as with almost all pathology, there is always, always a toxicological component. So why didn't they talk about the toxicological component? It's very simple. The reason is, is because if it's a toxicological issue, somebody has to take responsibility. Some company, some corporation, some industry that actually allowed that contaminant to get out. But when you blame it on a virus or a bacteria or some other pathogen, well, then it's naturally occurring. So now no industry or corporation or business or individual is going to be held responsible because it's going to be attributed to a natural cause. That's the difference, and I want you to keep that in mind because on the next video, we're going to be talking about a major industry that people have been talking about that is directly related to this. And because they couldn't allow a major industry to take a hit, that's why the coronavirus was blamed for this. But now let's get into the scientific corruption aspect. We're going to start off with a little bit of history about the coronavirus. This article actually gives a short brief history of the human coronavirus, which first was described in 1965 by a few researchers named Tyrell and Bayno. It was found in the human embryonic tracheal organ cultures obtained from the respiratory tracts of an adult with a common cold. And it has been attributed to the source of a common cold for a number of decades. Now, in the late 1960s, Tyrell was leading a group of virologists looking at a specific strain and was working with human strains and a number of animal viruses. Now, these included infectious bronchitis virus as well as mouse hepatitis virus and transmittable 
gastroenteritis virus from the porcine source, from swine, from, from pigs, all of which had been demonstrated to be morphologically the same as seen through electron microscopy as each other. So what this is basically saying is from the morphological characteristics, when looking through an electron microscope, the swine flu version or the swine virus version of this coronavirus, as well as the mouse hepatitis version, which affects the liver, as well as the infectious bronchitis virus that was found in humans were all morphologically the same. This new group of viruses was then named coronavirus, corona denoting the crown-like appearance of the surface projections and was later officially accepted as a new genus of viruses. So this goes back to the 1960s. In the three decades after discovery, human strains OC43 and 229E were studied exclusively, largely because they were the easiest ones to work with. It was easy to work with those, so that's what they predominantly worked with. Now, there were other ones, obviously, but those are the ones that they worked with. Now, what they found was from an epidemiologic and from a volunteer inoculation study, they found that the respiratory coronaviruses were associated with a variety of respiratory illnesses. However, their pathogenicity, i.e. their disease-causing ability, was considered to be low. So, not a big deal. Okay, that's basically what it comes down to. Now, while the research was proceeding to explore the pathogenicity, the ability for this to cause disease, and the epidemiology, the incidence of how virulent this virus was, and of this coronavirus, the number and importance of animal coronaviruses were growing rapidly. So they were starting to see this in other species. Chances are they were always there, we just were discovering them. Coronaviruses were described that caused diseases in multiple animals, including rats, mice, chickens, turkeys, calves, dogs, cats, rabbits, and pigs. Animal studies included, but were not limited to, research that focused on respiratory disorders. The study focus included disorders of the gastroenteritis, hepatitis, and encephalitis in mice. Now that's the gut, inflammation of the gut, inflammation of the liver, and inflammation of the brain in mice, as well as pneumonitis and sialodacrodenitis in rats, and then infectious peritonitis in cats, so these are all different types of peritonitis, for example, is inflammation of the peritoneum, the lining within the gut. It doesn't make any difference what these different things were. The point is they were studying them in different animals. All right. Then in the early 2000s, SARS came about. And the emergence of SARS, which is an acronym that stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, was the turning point when we started to look at the coronavirus with a different viewpoint. So during 2002-2003 outbreak, the SARS infection was reported in 29 countries in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. Overall, over 8,000 people were infected, and the specific strain was called 774 SARS-related, and that was the, those were the fatalities. It's still unclear how the virus entered the human population and whether the Himalayan palm civet, which is a type of a cat, were the natural reservoir for the virus. That's what it was attributed to. They later did sequential analysis of the virus and they isolated from Himalayan palm cats and revealed that this virus contained a 29 nucleotide sequence not found in most human isolates. So basically, there were 29 nucleotide components that were different from humans that humans didn't have but these cats had, had it and so that's why they attributed it to a spread from these civets all right now it was the SARS epidemic that actually launched the interest into coronavirus and there was a lot of effort time money put in to understand the coronavirus and most of the pathogenesis of the coronavirus infections were accumulated from the veterinary virological arena. So most of the vets that were, the veterinarians that were working with um, viruses actually contributed a lot of the research to our understanding of coronavirus. So that's just a brief history of where coronavirus started. Uh, the SARS epidemic was a dramatic reminder that animal coronaviruses are potential threats to the human population, although the exact mechanism of species to species spread still has not been determined, all right? It was felt to be spreading from animals, but they still never established it. Now let's go on to 
the current issue with the with the coronavirus that has caused the outbreak in 2020 and look at the specific version of this coronavirus. So this particular version is called COVID-19. Now, it's been labeled as a bioweapon by some people. And of course, the media, you know, says that that's conspiracy theory, blah, blah, blah. But let's look at the actual configuration of what this virus, what COVID-19 is. All right. So the first thing is I want to say that this wasn't because people were eating bat soup, okay, or transferred from snakes or, or sloths or whatever they said. The virus is not a naturally occurring phenomena. This is very important. And I'm going to show you evidence of that. All right. Back over 20 years ago, the Chinese government talked about how their long range plan for ensuring Chinese national sovereignty, if you will, was going to involve the use of biological weapons. Now, here's what it comes down to. There's no possibility that this virus occurred naturally. This was confirmed on February 8th by peer reviewed virology journal, volume 16, publication date, April 2020. And it's talking about the spike glycoprotein of the new coronavirus 2019 NCOV, which is basically the COVID-19, contains a furin-like cleavage site absent in, in coronavirus of the same clad. So this furin-like cleavage site is absent in the regular coronavirus. It is present in COVID-19. That's very, very important. And I will come back to that. There's an underlying implication here that this is, this is very subtle, but the only possible reason for this modification is the creation of a biological warfare weapon. There are no other plausible explanations. Now, that sounds a little far-fetched, I agree, but wait, you're going to understand. Because when you start understanding this furin cleavage component that we're talking about, then it starts to make a little bit of sense. But why would somebody do that? Well, or how can we prove that somebody actually did that? So we're going to talk about that. Now, this virus was actually created at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and they published the highlights of the creation in November 2015. The list of scholars associated with this Frankenstein of a virus, you'll see, named Zheng Li Shi, who just happens to represent the key laboratory of special pathogens and biosafety, Wuhan Institute of Virology, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Wuhan, China. Of course, there were other scientists, but most of them representing the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, location, but they were also representatives from the Bellinzona Institute of Microbiology from Zurich, Switzerland, as well as Harvard Medical School. All right. Now, Dr. Shi, she's a key figure here. In 2014, Dr. Shi was the recipient of a number of U.S. government grants, as well as grants from the National Basic Research Program of China, the Chinese Academy of Science, the National Natural Science Foundation of China, and from the Strategic Priority Research Program of Chinese Academy of Sciences to assist in funding research into coronaviruses. Now, this is, remember, 2015, all right? What's interesting is that the U.S. government paid Dr. Shi and the Chinese government to fund research into coronaviruses. Now, what did we get for this research that we paid the taxpayer money went for? So this is what we got using the SARS-CoV-2 genetic system. It goes into some specifics on the type of viruses that we're looking at the backbone of the virus. The results indicate that group 2B viruses encoding the specific version that they were looking at in a wild type backbone this is SHC014 spike in a wild type backbone, meaning the naturally occurring virus can efficiently use multiple orthologs of the SARS receptor, human angiotensin converting enzyme ACE2. Now, I want to talk about the this issue with the angiotensin converting enzymes in a later video. It's not pertinent here, but it is pertinent when we start talking about some of the misinformation regarding treatments that's coming out goes on to say that both monoclonal antibody and vaccine approaches failed to neutralize and protect from infection with coronavirus using the novel spike protein. So this novel spike protein was essentially something that they introduced into the coronavirus, and it essentially was a morphological departure from the naturally occurring coronavirus using the backbone of the virus. The implications are very, very suspect. All right, so they took SARS, the virus that caused SARS in 2002, 2003, 
and they, that was carried by bats, making the rounds back in 2003 and reverse engineered the genetic coding itself inside the virus. Now they took the backbone of the original wild type virus and that's when they started messing around with it. They then inserted additional proteins to enhance the efficacy of the virus inside the human lung, specifically inside the, for, the, for the human aspect, making it extremely difficult to vaccinate against because a new virus has multiple proteins with which to attack. So basically what they did was they made a bug, a virus, into a super virus. What would be the purpose of doing such a thing? Well, it'll become self-evident here in a few moments. What's also interesting is that these coronaviruses that they took from the SARS component and then they manipulated them, these cells were originally obtained from Fort Detrick. You may remember that Fort Detrick was also where some of the other HIV testing had been done and, and research had been done. And my friend Garth Nicholson, who used to be the director of laboratory at MD Anderson, wrote a book called Project Daylily about his work with some of the stuff that happened with the special forces, some of the research that was done at Fort Detrick, some of the stuff that was done from the in, in the HIV arena. And again, a lot of the stuff was done at Fort Detrick. So it's it's interesting that the correlation, this is like, you know, 20, 25 years ago. All right, so they say in the paper in 2015, remember they went back, this is going on from 2003 to 2015 now, they were looking at the SARS component from 2003, the coronavirus that caused SARS, and they were now manipulating that, and they published this manipulation study, what after they manipulated it, this, they published it in this 2015 paper, and they created this hybrid virus, which is far more deadly and can't be vaccinated against. It is resistant to vaccination because of certain morphological changes that were created to the wild type backbone. The new DNA genetically engineered virus cons constitutes a gain in pathogenesis. Now, I want you to remember what gain in pathogenesis means, okay? Or gain of function is the term that they use in virology or actually in, in research. So gain of function. Okay, here it is. That's a gain of function right there. They admit it. Gain of function basically means taking something and making it more potent, all right? So pathogenesis means lethal, the, the lethalness and the infectiousness of something. The pathogenesis is the cause of the actual problem, the cause of the disease. And Dr. Shi learns how to perform gain-of-function operations within viruses, and then she returns to her post in Wuhan, China. So she learned this in University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. They get the cells from Fort Detrick, and now she goes back to Wuhan, which is where uh, the techniques that she learned about gain of function were then applied. Fast forward to November 2019, a breach of containment occurs at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and patient zero is detected somewhere between December 1st and December 12th. Now we don't know about the details. We don't know who the patient uh, zero was, but apparently there was a uh, breach in containment. Now, I'm just going to quickly go over this. Dr. Shi is one of the authors that published this paper in January 23rd, 2020, saying that stating that it is of probable bat origin. The problem is she knows what it is and what the origin is because she was the one who created it. Okay, she helped to enhance it. She this is an enhanced version of the hybrid virus that they helped develop at UNC with Fort Detrick support back in 2015. Dr. Shi knows this because she helped to build it. Now, what does gain of function mean? Again, as I mentioned, gain of function is basically that it made it more potent. It made it more virulent. It made it more deadly. It made it more resistant. It made it more effective and made it into a super bug that nobody has basically seen before. That's what that means, okay? And it's also remember that the... This good doctor and her team inserted HIV and MERS proteins into the coronavirus to give it just a touch more kick. This is part of what they did with the coronavirus. So you're taking HIV and MERS, both causes of a lot of disease, a lot of death, a lot of mayhem, and they inserted proteins from HIV and MERS into the coronavirus. So they took proteins from one pathogen cause one disease, another pathogen cause another disease, and they put both of those into this hybrid virus 
that is now known as COVID-19. And we'll talk about the specific things that you can do, but there's a lot of misinformation about what people can do to prevent the incidence of COVID-19 or coronavirus in themselves. And this misinformation is actually completely opposite to know the truth. And so the things that could protect you, that could help you, there and that will actually protect you based upon the research that's already been done. There are actually people out there saying, don't do that because it's going to make you more susceptible, which is absolutely categorically a lie. It's the opposite that you should be doing, that you should be aware of. And these are not drugs. So these are naturally occurring substances. You can just go and get some of this. And we'll talk more about this as we get through this video series. Now, in this article, this was published in 2015. They're talking about the new SARS-like virus can jump directly from bats to humans, no treatment available. Now, this is 2015. This is five-year-old information. And this was from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where Dr. She had been working. All right. This virus is highly pathogenic and treatments developed against the original SARS virus in 2002 and the ZMAP drugs used to fight Ebola failed to neutralize and control this particular virus. So building resources rather than limiting them to both examine animal populations for new threats and develop therapeutics is key for limiting future outbreaks. So they were already concerned about the potential for outbreaks. In fact, they're talked about in this particular one with the SARS, they were talking about how the outbreak was controlled through public health in interventions and the original virus was thought to have been extinct since 2004. But now what do they do? They take this virus that we haven't seen since this outbreak in 2002, 2003, and they start messing with it. They start playing with it. They start inserting proteins that they get from HIV and MERS, and they put them into this coronavirus that we thought had actually disappeared and make it more virulent. They make, it makes it into a Superman version of this virus. And there is no known treatment against it. And there's going to be no vaccination that's going to be effective against it. But again, let's hold off. Don't let's not panic because what I want to show here is how it was the scientific community that knew about this. And yet they're sitting here making stuff. Why are they making this? And why are they doing gain of function? Why is University of North Carolina involved with this? Why, why are we funding? Why is the U.S. government funding this research on something that we thought had already disappeared? Why are they trying to get gain of function? Now, there, you know, some people would say, well, they were just experimenting. They were doing whatever. But there were actual other scientists that opposed this information. They did not want this, these studies to be done because they were afraid of a breakout. They were afraid of what the what the ramification would be if there was an outbreak, if the virus was not contained. So this was not something that was just uh, was obscure. There were some very well-known people that were against this. All right. Okay. Now, there's a lot of people talking about the coronavirus misinformation and then saying it's, it's uh, misinformation, it's controversial, it's conspiracy theory. But they're, they're not really looking at the science. So I want to first... After having built the case, what I just did, I want to show you the actual study that was done. Okay, now this was published in 2015, November 12th, 2015. And uh, this is actually the full article, the full research paper that was done. But what I want to do is I want to bring your attention to this March 2020 note that has been put there by the editors. And I want to read that first, then I'm going to go through the study, and then I want you to decide what this really means. So the editor's note before we start says, we are aware that this story is being used as a basis of unverified theories that the novel coronavirus causing COVID-19 was engineered. There is no evidence that this is true. Scientists believe that an animal is the most likely source of the coronavirus. Now it's obviously whoever wrote this from the editor's note perspective was either an idiot or doesn't understand the English language, but certainly wasn't a scientist because I'm going to now show you what the study says. Remember, this is a warning now that they're putting here to dissuade people, to prevent them from actually looking at the science, to tell you that, look, just because you see it and it's blue, it doesn't mean it's blue. The sky is not blue. Yeah, it looks blue to you, but it's not really blue. Don't believe it. It's not blue. It's actually yellow, but it's not blue. Whatever you see and you think it's blue, it's not blue. So what am I talking about? You see for yourself. In November of 2015, 
an experiment that created a hybrid version of a bat coronavirus, one related to the virus that caused SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, as we discussed before, has triggered renewed debate over whether engineering lab variants of viruses with possible pandemic potential is worth the risk. This is the lead component, the first paragraph of the study that was published in Nature, probably one of the most respected journals in the world. The first paragraph, again, I'm going to read this so that you can understand. Take this for the words that I'm saying. I'm not embellishing anything. I'm not exaggerating anything. This is the very first paragraph. An experiment that created a hybrid version of a bat coronavirus, one related to the virus that caused SARS, has triggered renewed debate over whether engineered lab variants of viruses with possible pandemic potential is worth the risk. Okay, this is where we start. Now, it goes on, starts talking about the same thing we talked about earlier, the SCHO014 version. But I'm just going to focus in on the, on the parts that are highlighted because I've read these things like half a dozen times now and decided to highlight them to, so that when I'm doing this video, it's easy for me to focus in on the important parts. So although almost all coronaviruses isolated from bats have not been able to bind to the key human receptor, which is this SHC014, which is the specific coronavirus we're talking about, was able to bind to human protein, was able to get into the, the human vector, but it's not the first one that could do so. In 2013, researchers actually reported this ability for the first time in a different coronavirus isolated from the same bat population. So as far back as 2013, seven years ago, we knew that there were certain viruses from bats that certain strains that consisted of this SCH014 as well as other strains that could actually go from the bat vector to the human vector. Now, creation of a chimera. What is that? Well, let's look at, I'm just going to go in so that you can understand what the defini definition of chimera is. So something that's chimeric, okay? It's a, a mythical animal formed from parts of various animals. That's what chimeric means. This is looking at the definition on a search engine. All right. It's also hoped for, built, uh, illusory, or impossible to achieve. From a biological standpoint, the definition of chimeric is relating to or denoting an organism containing a mixture of genetically different tissues formed by processes such as fusion of early embryos, grafting, or mutation. So this is actually taking something chim chimeria or chimeric means to adulterate, transform, adjust, change through early fusion of embryos, grafting, mutation, whatever it takes to change the morphological characteristic of whatever the substance or organism is as it appears naturally. All right, so that's what chimeria means or chimeric means. Creation of a chimeria means creation of a mutation. That's what they're saying. So again, this is the study. All right. I want you to keep on thinking back to what these idiots said. We're aware that the story is being used as a basis for unverified theories. There's no evidence that this is true. The scientists believe that an animal is the most likely source of coronavirus. Okay. Well, we're reading exactly what the study says. This is what you see reading the blue and they're saying, whatever you see, it's not blue. All right. So, creation of a chimera. The latest study was already underway before the U.S. moratorium began. And this is a moratorium that the government imposed a moratorium on federal funding of such research. Research that would uh, ease the spread or host range of dangerous pathogens. So, basically, the government in 2014 said, okay, we're not going to fund any research that is related to creating, adulterating, changing a pathogen to make it more dangerous. We're not going to do any more funding for chimeric reasons for to, to create chimeria. We're not going to do that. We're not going to create any more mutants grafted, changing genetically with using different tissues to form a new mythical animal. We're not going to do that anymore. That's what the government said in 2014, and they put a moratorium on it. However, one, the moratorium was already began. The U.S. National Institute of Health and that's going to become important. Who runs the U.S. National Institute of Health? We're going to talk about that. Some obscure person named Anthony Fauci, I think is how you pronounce it, Fauci. And I'm going to show his information in a second. 
U.S. National Institute of Health allowed it to proceed while it was underway by the agency, says Ralph Barrick, an infectious disease researcher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he was a co-author of the study. The NIH eventually concluded that the work was not so risky as to fall under the moratorium, he says. Now, this is a, something the government decided they weren't going to do. And now, under the auspices of the director of the National Institute of Health, who's been there, by the way, for 30 years, and we're going to talk about him in just in a moment, this mutation of this virus, the study in 2015, was allowed to occur. All right? Now, Wayne Hobson, a very respected virologist, he disapproved of the study because he said it provided little benefit and reveals little about the risks that the wild SHC014 virus in bats poses to humans. Other experiments in the study show that the virus in the wild bats would need to evolve to pose any threat to humans. Okay, It would need to evolve. It would need to change. It would take time. A change that may never happen, although it cannot be ruled out. Barrick and his team reconstructed the wild virus, the naturally occurring form of the virus, from its genome sequence and found that it grew poorly in human cell cultures and caused no significant disease in mice. Okay, so here you're looking at a virus. It's found in bats. It's very difficult for it to jump to humans. Once in a human, it, in human cell cultures, it just grew very poorly. And in the mouse model, it didn't cause any significant disease. All right. The only impact of this work is the creation in a lab of a new non-natural risk, agreed Richard Elbright, a molecular biologist and biodefense expert at Rutgers University in Piscataway, New Jersey. Both Elbright and Wayne Hobson are long-standing critics of gain-of-function research. What is gain-of-function? It is taking something using the chimeric process to adulterate change, make it super, make a make a bug into a super bug. Gain of function meaning increasing the virulence of a pathogen. So, Ebright and Wayne Hobson, long-standing critics of gain of function research. Why would you take any kind of organism and make it more potent? Why would you take a bug, a virus, a bacteria, and make it more potent? Right? What's the purpose of that? Well, they say it's for research purposes. But why would you do research to make something more potent? Why wouldn't you do research to make something that's not that bad anyway, less damaging, but they're making it more potent. They're doing gain of function studies. This is a gain of function study on COVID-19. This is what created it. This is a gain of function study that was done on a specific strain of coronavirus called the SHC014 strain. They then did a furtin-like cleavage site, which was absent. They created this cleavage site. They added proteins for MERS and HIV. They did all sorts of stuff. I'm not a virologist. I don't know all the stuff they did, but I can tell you they did a hell of a lot of stuff that they shouldn't have been doing to this virus, to this particular strain of virus that's called the SHC014 coronavirus. And then they made it into something that should have never been created. Okay? They created a chimera, a mutant form of this coronavirus, which is known as COVID-19. Studies testing hybrid viruses in human cell cultures and animal models are limited in what they can say about the threat posed by a wild virus. So when you're studying this stuff, we should be studying the virus as it occurs in nature, not by humans, by mankind, making them more virulent, by, by making a superbug out of it. Remember H1N1, okay? There was a patent filed by Baxter in Austria nine months before the first document case of H1N1. This type of stuff has been going on. They've been taking viruses and bacteria and doing weird things to them and making super bugs. Why? For research purposes or right here? Scientific review panels may deem similar studies studying, uh, studies building chimeric viruses based on circulating strains too risky to pursue. Yeah, no shit it's just amazing to me that this has been happening studies testing hybrid viruses in human cell cultures and animal models are limited in what they can say about the threat posed by a wild virus dasek says agrees but he argues that they can help indicate which pathogen should be prioritized for fear further research attention now that's the most absurd statement because they're saying okay 
It should be limited, but you know what? It can help us to prioritize further research. So we need to make these superbugs so then we can then warrant our research to go and look at these superbugs and how they affect the human system. How about doing something even a little bit more effective and not create the damn superbug in the first place? Like you really need to create a superbug and then try to see how it should be prioritized, you know, so they can help indicate which pathogens should be prioritized for further research. I mean, that's the most absurd thing to say. We're going to take a bunch of different viruses and then we're going to see which ones we can create the, the most potent chimeric changes to. And then once we create this chimera, then we'll go ahead and it'll warrant our priority to which virus we should really work on or focus in on. Well, don't create these super bugs in the first damn place and you won't have to worry about which one you need to prioritize. It gets a little bit more obscure here. I want to now talk about Anthony Fochi. Okay. This is an episode from a podcast. Terry Michaels actually did this particular podcast. Um, and this is a little history about Anthony Fochi. As director of the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, Dr. Anthony Fochi controls the direction of AIDS research. By the way, this was in 2014. We're going to come back to him in a second. But this is uh, from the same Nature magazine that I just, uh, the journal that I showed you. But basically, uh, Robert Kennedy had posted this, and he and I talked about this uh, a couple times in the last few days. But basically, again, as I said before, it grows remarkably well in human cultures. This is a, this is a Simon Wayne Hobson, a virologist at the Pasteur Institute. He points out that the researchers have created a novel virus that grows remarkably well in human cultures. Remember, the original wild type doesn't do well in human cultures. If the virus escaped, nobody could predict the trajectory, he says. And this was back in 2015, 12th November 2015, same journal. And this goes on to talk a little bit more about the COVID-19. Now, it's interesting that Bobby Kennedy said that there were three countries that are naturally hostile to each other, which is China, Taiwan, and Japan. And all three of them independently concluded that COVID-19 originated in the United States. Now, how could a virus endemic to Chinese bats spread from America? Well, that's what we just covered, right? The 2015 article in Nature raises the possibility that NIH-funded scientists creating the coronavirus pandemic. Yes, they did. I just showed you the evidence of that. The Dr. Shi studied at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She was part of the team. And most of the people that wrote that study were also from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, but there were also people from Harvard and from Switzerland involved with that. We just went over that, right? Now, it goes on to talk about the creation of a chimera, which I just showed you. And now let's talk a little bit about Anthony Fauci. All right. Media darling Anthony Fauci, who funded the risky lab experiment to create the novel coronavirus from Chinese bats, now spins the official narrative that the pandemic began in China. Well, China, Taiwan, and Japan, all three countries that are hostile to each other, they have already said that this started in the United States. And they're right. It did. All right. Now, Trump reportedly growing frustrated with Dr. Fauci's blunt approach. Hmm. I wonder why. Because Trump knows certain things. He knows what's happening here based upon, you can see his cavalier approach. And we've talked about that before in the Instagram, Facebook posts. But essentially, he's the one who's out there saying, you know, whipping up the story about the China bats, blah, blah, blah. Yet he's the person who did all the HIV studies. Remember that? He's the one who funded them and talked about the viral causation of HIV three years before the first, before anybody even saw the virus. And, and there's some contention whether anybody's ever seen the HIV virus in the first place. But he pushed for the drugs. He's been at the NIH for 36 years. He was the one who allowed the chimeric studies to be done on the coronavirus in 2014, even when the moratorium by the government was no more research on creating superbugs. He allowed it to continue. And then he created, he funded it from, they supplied the, the virus from Fort Detrick. He funded it, the government in the United States and China funded it. And then this Dr. Xi went back to Wuhan. And then, of course, it got released or there was an outbreak in Wuhan. But where did it all start? It started here in the United States, in North Carolina. So he's often asked. Dr. Fochi has become a household name during the coronavirus outbreak, frequently appearing on TV as a trusted expert on diseases. Yeah, a trusted expert who created the damn thing in the first place, who funded it, who pushed it, who went against a moratorium that the government had passed in 2014. 
often tasked with setting the record straight on facts, misconstrued or misrepresented by President Donald Trump, Fucci has been left in awkward positions in White House briefings. Really? So now we're going to blame President Donald Trump for misconstrued or misrepresented facts when it's Fucci who's lying to the public and has created more mayhem than any person on the planet? I mean, he's shut down the entire governmental communication between different countries and shut down the economies, crashed the market, all because of him pushing for the research and allowing the research to go, even though the government said no more research in that area. Somebody needs to... A New York Times reporter Monday said that Trump has become frustrated with Dr. Fucci. Of course, if I was a commander-in-chief, I would be frustrated with him too. I would have strung him up already. With Fochi's blunt approach at the briefing lecterns, which often contradicts things that the president has just said, according to two people familiar with the dynamic. Fochi also made headlines on Sunday when he said in an interview with Science Magazine, I can't jump in front of the microphone and push him down. The last portion of this, we talk about some of the continuing misinformation out there. So here's breaking news, first COVID-19 related death reported in San Antonio. Now, the reason this is kind of important to me personally is because I did my general surgery residency. I was an intern at Brook Army Medical Center. I spent a lot of time there as a, as a fourth year medical student. And then, of course, I did my internship in general surgery, my first year postgraduate training after internship, after I went to Korea. When I came back, I did my general surgery residency, began that at Brook Army Medical Center. So a woman in her 80s died at Brook Army Medical Center on Saturday, officials announced. Okay. This was just posted I just saw this uh, today, actually Monday, which is it's not Tuesday morning, but I saw it Monday. Now, they're, they're reporting it as a first COVID-19 related death reported in San Antonio. Now, here's the kicker. This is the family member, Ashley Zara Farrell, off that person. It says KSAT12 and KSAT.com. I must say I'm highly disappointed at your lack of facts. My grandmother did not pass away at a San Antonio MMC She passed away at a local inpatient hospice facility. Remember, hospice is for people that are terminal, that are going to die. She did not pass away from COVID-19. She passed away from Alzheimer's and that she had had suffered from for the past 12 years and a case of aspiration pneumonia that worsened her ailing state. Shame on you, KSAT. Again, the media is hyping this crap and scaring people. But the information is that right now in Wuhan, reports of no new cases for the last five straight days. And they're actually talking about um, life coming back to normal. Uh, Checkpoints are are being removed. Health workers uh, disinfecting subway cars and stations. And leaders met Monday to discuss scheduling the resumption of work and production. So this is... Interesting, Monday marks two months since Chinese authorities placed Wuhan on lockdown and the virus spread like wildfire throughout the city and greater Hubei province. Last thing I want to talk about is a little bit about politics here. Senator Rand Paul, who is a doctor, by the way, um, they said that he was reckless. Again, the media is reporting he's reckless. His actions on coronavirus, he apparently got exposed to coronavirus and they're saying that you know, he's even though he's got coronavirus, he's still meeting with other people. He's uh, working out in the gym and that's not responsible, blah, blah, blah. Again, they're trying to, you know, make him look bad. But this is what Senator Paul had said. I met his father, uh, Congressman Ran, uh, Ron Paul, just recently and had a nice five, six minute conversation, actually closer to 10 minute conversation with him uh, in uh, Mexico at uh, an Acapulco conference where I gave a lecture and Senator Rand Paul uh, was quoted to say, we absolutely must, must resist government run amok taking advantage of a crisis. This is how your liberty dies. Stand up America and resist. Department of Justice seeks new emergency powers amid coronavirus pandemic. This is the issue. This is what we need to be afraid of, that they're going to use this false flag type of event, hype it up to take away more rights, more freedoms and create mandatory actions that people have to do from quarantine to even more sinister things that are coming down the pipeline. So you need to be aware of this stuff. You need to be aware of the agenda. All right.